it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest, Tony Wheeler. Tony co-founded Lonely Planet Publications with his wife Maureen in 1973 after a six-month trek along Asia's hippie trail. And we'll get to whether or not you were really a hippie momentarily. He built the company to become one of the largest independent guidebook publishers in the world. Uh, and I heard this morning that the number of guidebooks sold is somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 million. Since the sale of Lonely Planet in 2011, Tony has been involved with the Planet Wheeler Foundation's work on more than 50 projects in the developing world and established the Wheeler Center for Books, Writing, and Ideas in Melbourne, Australia. We're excited to have him here with us tonight to share his insights and stories from his recent travels, including his Silk Road trip from Bangkok to London in an old MGB sports car. That's correct. <laughs> So welcome. Thank you. It's a, a thrill to be here. So I think we should talk about this crazy road trip that you just <laughs> did, which sounds like the reverse of the trip that you did in, in 1970. Yeah, it was, it was very much the reverse. And when we did the trip in the 70s, we, we started in London. Um, Maureen was like 21 or 22, and I was about 24, so we were much younger in those days. And um, we, we drove as far as Afghanistan and sold a car, our car for a $5 profit in Afghanistan <laughs> and carried on and ended up in Australia. And at the time, that trip was called the Asia Overland Route. And it, the idea was you sort of started in somewhere in Europe, London or Amsterdam or something, and you ended up in Kathmandu. And some people then carried on further down through Southeast Asia. But um, the, the, the name, the Hippie Trail, only came along later. But I rather like, I don't think we, we, weren't, we were never hippies. But, um, but it, it's a nice name. It's got a, it's got a bit of a ring to it. And periodically, I sort of get called back for that. Last, the the two, uh, two occasions I can think of most recently in the last five or ten years, one was just last year, the um, Victoria and Albert Museum in London was doing an exhibit about the um, music and, and art of the 60s. And part of that, they did a day about the Hippie Trail, and I came along and spoke at their Hippie Trail Day. So <laughs> the Hippie Trail sort of relives. But the other really amusing occasion I've had was um, the, the, the car that we bought in London in the 70s and drove to Afghanistan was a Mini, a um, little English Mini. And um, about five or six years ago, when BMW, who own Mini now, launched the Mini in China, I got this call, and they said, this is BMW China here. Um, we, we know you have a bit of a following in China, and we also know you drove to Afghanistan in a Mini. Could we get you to come to China to help launch the Mini? And I thought, wow, what an offer. <laughs> so, so I went to China. I remember I came out of the, at the airport terminal, and uh, there was a Mini Cooper S convertible parked there, and they said, here's the keys. We've set the sat-nav up to take you to your hotel go and discover how, what it's like driving a Mini in China. I'm <laughs> guessing it was a little different than it was in It was a little different, yeah. yeah. But this, this most recent trip, um, I'm not an MG enthusiast, but I, I knew some people who were, and they said, we, we're, we're going to spend four months driving 40-year-old MGs along, not the Hippie Trail, but the Silk Road um, through Southeast Asia, through China, through the Stands, through Iran, which is where I rejoined the Hippie Trail, Iran and Turkey, and into Europe. Um, we've got space for one more MG, so if you want to go out and buy a 40-year-old <laughs> MG. And they're easy to find. There's lots of them around. So I went out and bought a 40-year-old MG and had it sort of fixed up a little bit. And uh, April 1st, we uh, left Bangkok, and middle of July, we arrived in London, 19 countries later. Wow. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about your experience in Iran? Yeah, we, um, we drove through Iran, and I've been to Iran a number of occasions, and the, um, the other people in the other cars were all couples. It was all husband and wife teams, but Maureen, my wife, is, um, she's the chair of the Melbourne Arts Festival in Melbourne, Australia, and she was very tied up with meetings and things for that, and she, she couldn't come along as my co-driver, so I ended up having a number of different co-drivers, including in Iran, I had my daughter dri co-driving, and I, I taught her to drive, you know, some years ago, and I was always terrified with her behind the wheel. But in Iran, she fitted right in because <laughs> the driving is somewhat um, exciting in Iran. There's a, 
But, uh, you know, it's, it's, Iran is, it's, it seems to me, is the friendliest country out there. You know, women do get to drive. I, I, we, we were just before we came here, I was wondering, you know, why is Saudi Arabia the, the big friend and Iran is the big enemy when Iran is the democracy? It's, it's not the perfect democracy, but it's, nevertheless, they vote for the person they want and Saudi Arabia isn't. Iran is where women can even race cars and they certainly they race cars all the time, it seems to me, <laughs> and drive taxis. In Saudi Arabia, they can't even drive. Um, you know... Iran certainly wasn't the terrorist thing in 9-11. That was Saudi Arabia. Why is it Saudi is the friend and Iran is the enemy? I can't understand it. <laughs> we had a great time in Iran. We had a great time everywhere. Um, at the end of it, we sort of sat down and said, well, okay, they, everybody was friendly all the way across. But which was the country you would say was the most outgoing and friendliest? And we all agreed Uzbekistan. I don't know why, but the Uzbekis were just the most engaged. They always wanted to ask you where you'd been and welcome you. And I don't know, they were just, you know, it's, it's sad what's the, the reputation they've got for themselves this week almost. Yeah. But, but um, when you're there in Uzbekistan, it's a different story. And what about the differences between or among the stands? Because we were just speaking backstage about yeah. Turkmenistan. Yeah, well, um, the, the two, the, I'd, I'd, the only country in the stands, I'd, there's five of them. And I can now name them all instantly. <laughs> um, and we didn't go to one of them. We didn't go to Tajikistan. But um, the other four we went to. And one of them I had been. I'd been to Kazakhstan oh, about 10 years ago to see a space launch. Um, you know, all, all the Russian um, space launches from Sputnik 1 onwards all go up from Baikonur in Kazakhstan. And um, I went down there because there was a Soyuz launcher going up to um, take a Russian cosmonaut, an American NASA astronaut, up to the um, International Space Station, and a tourist, uh, an American Richard Garriott, an American computer game entrepreneur, of mm. course, who had the spare $30 million that it cost you to have two weeks on the International <laughs> Space Station. And it was a fascinating week because we went to the Cosmonaut Training Center in Moscow to see what they went through there. And we, we went down to Baikonur to, um, see the, to see the launch. We met the cosmonaut and astronaut and tourist and saw the launch. It was all fantastic. Um, but it was also fantastic because there was a, there were about 10 or 12 of us, two of the group being um, Sergey Brin and Larry Page. So there was, and you know, they always say with big important companies, you know, you should never have your top people all on the <laughs> same plane at once. Well, we all flew down from Moscow to Baikonur in this rattly old Tupolev. And you know, and we had um, Brin, Page, and also Schmidt, all three of them on the plane together, <laughs> and me. Um, <laughs> if it had gone down, they wouldn't have noticed that I was there. Um, so I'd, I'd been to Kazakhstan before. But the, the stands were all different, and Kyrgyzstan, which was the one I knew least about, I w half the time I was there, I was thinking, I'm in Switzerland, because it was green and lush, and these beautiful mountains, snow-capped mountains in the background, and little rivers running through. And then I think, no, I'm not. I'm on the Mongolian steppes, because it was sort of plains and mountains in the background, and yurts and horses riding by. And then I was thinking, no, I'm in a Western European town, <laughs> because it was street cafes and people sitting drinking coffee or having a cold beer even. Right. And I'm thinking, no, I'm actually I'm in New Zealand. because <laughs> So Kyrgyzstan was just, you know, something different all the time. Uh, um, and then Uzbekistan was very friendly. And then Turkmenistan was completely weird. I have been to, I've been to North Korea. Someone's nodding over here. They've been there. Um, and Ashgabat, the m marble and gold capital of, um, of, of Turkmenistan, I decided afterwards it was a cross between Pyongyang in North Korea and Las Vegas. <laughs> it was just, it was the wackiest place I've ever been to. I just couldn't believe anything about it. And a you said that, place. that it was a little 1984 and yeah, your camera the, was... Your hand was swapped away from your camera. Yeah, there was the the, the um, it's all white marble and gold and gold statues of the former president for life, the Turkmen Bashi. Um, but there'd be these avenues of apartment buildings, just sort of stretching to the distance, and you'd look down them and you'd say, I can't see any people. Where are the people who live in these? And there's no cars going by. Well, it's just empty. Mm -hmm. And then you'd, there'd be government off. It's only got a population of 5 million. Why is there government office after government office after government office? 
and no people around, nobody around. And you, you wanted to be photographing it all because it was so photogenic. And you could photograph most things, but you couldn't photograph any government building. But it was hard to tell. Is that a bank or a hotel or a government building? Well, there's one way to find out. Get your camera out and try and take a photograph of it. If it's a government building, immediately someone jumps out from behind a bush <laughs> where he's been hiding, waiting for a photographer to appear. Um, th 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 nothing really happens. You just get told off, don't do that. And uh, so a lot of the monuments would have guards standing out front. And they'd be rather like you know, guards in a lot of places, the sentry box and the guard with his gun standing there and standing rigidly to attention in the sun and staring straight ahead. And obviously, you, what do you do? You take a photograph of them. But then there's an, another guard there whose job is to stop you taking photographs of those <laughs> two guards. So there was always three guards, the two guards photogenically standing there and the one hidden away to stop you taking photographs of the other two. It was just wacky. It sounds surreal. It was surreal. Yeah, yeah. Totally. I, I, we were there for two days in, in Ashgabat. We had a few more days in other places in Turkmenistan, but we were two days in Ashgabat and I could have had another week. I would like to have explored more. Because it was just so fascinating and bizarre. It was strange, yeah. very yeah. strange. Tell us about um, when you got to the end. I'm going back in time to 1973. You got to Australia, and you and Maureen found work. Yeah. And I, you also had a mechanical engineering degree, yes? Yeah, I, I did it originally. I had a very, very strange education that my father was... I was born in Britain, and my... Father worked for the airline that is now British Airways. It had a different name back then. Um, and as a result, I lived in different places around the world. First of all, when I was small, Pakistan. And then, um, and then I lived in the Bahamas for a while. Very nice. <laughs> and then I lived in America. And I lived in America for my last year in primary school and most of my high school years. I was seventh, sixth grade through 11th grade. I was in America. First of all, in Detroit... But I always immediately said, followed that by saying, when Detroit was wonderful. You know, in the 50s and early 60s, before it all went wrong, Detroit was the motor city, and it was a great pharmaceutical center as well. Um, it was, a, a, you know, important. It was the, the wealthiest capital, the wealthiest city in America per capita. Hmm. Amazing. You know, and then it all went wrong. So I was in Detroit, and, and then I was in Baltimore for a while before Baltimore went wrong as well. Um, and and so there's I, a pattern here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wherever I go, you know. <laughs> look I out, Melbourne. Look out, Ashgabat. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll get to Afghanistan. What I've done to that in a minute. But um, yeah, so I, I was, you know, and then I went back to England and uh, finished school in England and went to university and studied engineering, even though it was history I enjoyed most. Mm -hmm. But I always thought, you know, what am I going to do with history? You can't get a job in history, but engineering, I could sort of see an end purpose to. So I did engineering, and I did work for a couple of years as an engineer, and then I went back to university and did an MBA. So, um, And we got out to Australia, and we, we got that. We, we'd sold the car in Afghanistan and carried on and eventually ended up in Indonesia and hitched a ride on a New Zealand yacht down to Australia. So we, we landed on a beach off a yacht, and hitchhiked across Australia. And I always remember we arrived in Sydney just after Christmas. This is 1972, so 45 years ago. Shows how old I am. Um, and we, we got into the last ride we hitched, dropped us off in the centre of Sydney. And Maureen said, well, we made it. We, we started out from London. We thought we'd take about six months, and we have. We thought we'd get here, you know, without much money left and then start looking for jobs to earn the money to go back to, back to Europe. How much money have we got left? And because I was looking after the money, and I put my hand in my pocket, and I said, well, we've got 27 cents. <laughs> and that was literally what we had left. And we, had, we, didn't have a, we didn't have a note. We only had coins. <laughs> um, so what did I, you do? Well, I had a camera, and I went up to a, the, the King's Cross, which is sort of the, still is the sex and sin center of um, Sydney, and um, I found a loan shop, and I got $25 for my camera. And... Um, Maureen got a job that afternoon working in a cafe, and, um, and, we d and it was a holiday the next day, so all the food that didn't get eaten, she brought home that night and <laughs> <laughs> kept us going for a couple of days, and I got a job a couple of days later, and wow. away it went. And, yeah. and at that time, you had all of these notes. I yeah, we had, we had, at that point, we had no idea we were about to become travel publishers, but we, we got jobs in Sydney, and we'd, we hadn't, we'd intended to... The idea was we're going to spend six months traveling to across Asia to Australia on the hippie trail. 
we were going to live in Australia for three months and save up enough money to spend three months traveling back to, we thought we'd fly to, to America and spend a couple of months in the States and then come back to Europe and we'd get back to London after a year away. And I even had a job waiting for me, um, a sort of MBA engineering job mm. with Ford Motor Company, wow. um, which I never got back to. And, um, in, but instead, when we got to Australia, we thought, no, this, this is not a one-year trip around the world. This is a three-year trip. <laughs> and actually, it's a, it's a trip now that's stretched out to nearly 50 <laughs> years. <laughs> Um, we thought we'll, s we'll spend a year in Australia and we'll save up enough money to travel for another year. But then in that year, so many people asked us, what did you do, where did you go, how did you do it, that we created Lonely Planet. And were they Australians asking you? At first, yeah, yeah because um, you know, it was a lot of people were wanting to do pretty much what we'd done. You know, the, the, the hippie trail was developing and yeah. they were wanting to you know, head out across Asia and head towards Europe. Although there was also, a, you know, a lot of things were in change at that time. You know, the Vietnam War, at that point, if you, if you mentioned Southeast Asia to Americans, you know, they, they would say, no, there's a war going on there. You know, Vietnam was the, that's what focused your attention on Southeast Asia. But on the other hand, Thailand was just starting to develop in a very small way as a tourist center. And Indonesia, having been closed off for years uh, by, during the Sukarno era, Sukarno had only been out of power in Suharto Inn for a few years, and Indonesia was just starting to open up. And I remember I, I, I did a radio program in Australia talking about the first Australian contact with Bali. And, you know, we were saying that actually in the late 60s and early 70s, Bali opened up for three things. It opened up for people like Maureen and I who were traveling through. Either they'd come from Europe and they were heading to Australia, or they'd just left Australia and were heading through on their way to Europe. So it was a sort of travel crossroads. The second thing was Bali had always been this great arts center mm -hmm. for music and dance and painting and everything else. And that was being rediscovered. And people were sort of who were interested in the art were suddenly they'd been for 20 years, 30 years, they hadn't been able to go there, and now they could, so the art was opening up. But the third thing, and this could be a very San Francisco thing, was surfing. The surfers, you know, who were starting to travel the world were just realizing there were great waves in Bali and were going there for the surf. Right. So you had these three groups, all sort of art, culture, surfing, and travel were all coming there at the same time. And a perfect time. destination. Perfect destination, yeah. yeah. So all these, these things sort of come together at the same time. So we did that first book about the Asia Overland trip, The Hippie Trail, and then we followed up with a guide to Southeast Asia because... Southeast Asia was opening up. And when did you realize, wow, we've created a company that might actually be a solvent business? Yeah. Ah, you know, well, I, the funny thing was my, uh, my father, um, he was getting on towards retirement age at that point, and, um, or a few years later. But you know, for a while, the business, um, he, w he was our sort of London, uh, English agent. The cars, his car got put outside, and the books were all stored in his garage. <laughs> Um, but I remember, you know, it took a while. It, it, this was not a dot-com business that, you know, it starts on day one and it's worth a billion dollars a couple of days later. It was a business that grew more gradually. Um, but I remember a few years down the, down the road when it was sort of starting to work, but my father was still saying, you know, you've got two university degrees, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> And I remember years later, I came around to the place and I said, Dad, look what I've got. And I picked him up in my Ferrari, <laughs> <laughs> which sort of convinced his fathers, you know, that things may, might be going okay. <laughs> and was your father, obviously, you lived abroad, so he, he traveled. He was keen on it, yeah. yeah. He, 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 he could see what I was doing and he liked it, yeah. you know, that was a, that was a factor. And even, when I was even when we were making no money, and, and I think a lot of small businesses, you know, they're even the sort of even the dot coms, they a lot of the people in dot com businesses. I, I've met Bill Gates once and spent an hour talking with him, and you know he he didn't start Microsoft to become the richest man in the world. He started Microsoft because he liked computers, and right. that's true with so many business things. People get into them. I got into that because I liked travel. Yeah, and no mechanical engineering. Ever since. Well, I don't right? know. You, you could drive an old car across <laughs> Asia, even, <laughs> even in 2017. You have to <laughs> delve under the hood occasionally and fix it. You and Maureen have two children? Is that we right? do, yeah, yeah. yeah. And are they travelers? Um, my daughter much more than my son. 
my my son um and I'm, I'm still I'm still saying to him you know, don't quit your day job my son wants to be a filmmaker and he did get a film into a, f a film festival in a small short in Seattle just a few months ago and then came down to San Francisco afterwards and had enjoyed himself here and my daughter helps to run our foundation we we had a foundation at Lonely Planet, the Lonely Planet Foundation it was called, and a percentage of Lonely Planet's profits went into that. But when we sold Lonely Planet 10 years ago, we couldn't say, you know, to the, the buyer, you're buying a business, and oh, by the way, it's got a charitable right. foundation as well. So quite a lot of the money we got from selling the business, we put into um, taking the Lonely Planet Foundation out of Lonely Planet and renaming it the Planet Wheeler Foundation, and three people run it. And one of them is my daughter, and she does a lot of travel for that. And one, one of the things that uh, the Planet Wheeler Foundation mainly works in education and health, um, uh, but we also do other things as well. You mentioned the, the Wheeler Center, which is M Melbourne's a city of literature. The UNESCO has a, a number of cities of literature around the world. Uh, which is the U.S. one? The one in the U.S. has a big writer's program at their university. It's Iowa. Iowa. Iowa, you're absolutely yeah. right, yeah. Um, uh, Edinburgh in Scotland is a city of literature, and Melbourne is one. And um, setting up the Wheeler Centre for Books, Writing and Ideas was part of the programme to get Melbourne onto that UNESCO list. But one of the other things that I spent a lot of time on since Lonely Planet, and you know we're sort of connecting from that through Planet Wheeler, is right here in San Francisco, Global Heritage Fund. It's an archaeology organisation. And um, the, the belief that Global Heritage has is that archaeology is wonderful, you know, and that they've got projects in the developing world. Um, you know, that, that, that's really important uh, to protect these sites and develop them and so on. But, um, you know, archaeology sites, you dig them up and somebody gets a PhD for discovering it and writing about it and so on. But longer term, they have to have local community involvement. Mm -hmm. Those sites are protected and looked after because... The local community has, you know, they run the guest house, the daughter works in the cafe, the son run, drives the minibus, the daughter's a guide. You know, they've, they've got this involvement with it, and as a result, they want to look after it. So Global Heritage does this, I think, fantastic thing that they both look at it from the archaeological point of view, but also from the local community point of view. And, you know, what do I know about archaeology? I love going to look at the sites, and because I'm with Global Heritage, I'm one of the directors, I very often get to be shown around the site by the, the archaeologist yeah. who first discovered it or whatever. Um, but the piece but that sounds up your alley is, is the, the tourism, tourism yeah, infrastructure. Exactly. That, that's that's, that that's what I... I place. don't know how well I do it, but that's what I do for <laughs> them, yeah. Um, on, on that, what happens when a place becomes over-touristed? That, that's a big topic right now. And I, I, I don't know what the answer is. You know, I mean, Barcelona is one of the places that has really, the, the local population has said, you know, we are getting too many tourists. I wish some of them would stay away. Um, I don't know. What, what do we do? Do we sort of start charging admission to places, you know, putting up? A, I, I think one of the other places that, uh, that I was reading in the, something, something in the media today about, again, looking at stopping big, um, big cruise ships coming into the lagoon in Venice. And I've been in Venice in the last year um, and seen the damn things coming by, you know, dwarfing the place but Venice which I love and I've you know been there a number of times over the years and it's a place that people often say is over, over touristed and yet in many ways it's not yeah. because so many of the tourists are just day trippers and once they leave or get back on their cruise ship the town's often sort of you you're, you're a bit deserted at night or you know? if you go off the beaten if you path, go off the beaten track yeah. all you have to do is go f a few steps away from St. Mark's Square and the place is packed with these amazing churches yeah. and things and I've so often got into a church and you know sat down in the pews and got the guidebook out and sat there to read about this painting and that sculpture and so on and then looked around and realized I'm in Venice I'm at the height of the tourist season and Maureen and I are the only people in this church yeah you know it, it's not uh, over touristed it's under touristed almost right but, it, you know, the, the problem often is not that over-touristed. It's too many tourists in the same place yeah. and not spreading out enough. I've, I've often said, you know, all you need to do to get away from tourists is be a day's drive away from the airport. Mm. And you can go to... I, I'm still delighted that you find places in the world where you can be seven... I was in Tibet about 15 years ago, and we, we traveled way out to the west. We'd been walking there, and then we 
we had a, a truck and a land cruiser and we were heading back to Lhasa, which was the nearest airport, and it was seven days' drive. We had to drive for seven days before we got to the airport. Wow. And that's fantastic. And the other thing I still really like about travel is I, I still like that, you know, you can still, no matter how much travel you've done, you can still be astonished. Um, and things that I didn't know about that. You know, I, I found that in the stands. Yeah. I was astonished by Ashgabat. Why did I not know about this wacky capital? Well, and I, I think that, that that awe and that wonder, I mean, I don't even really want to ask you how many countries you've been to. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> <laughs> but that you can still find that is All the time. a testament to just the power well, of travel. Well, one of the, um, the places I, I uh, on this trip, of, again, that I found that I... You didn't know about I, I did know about it and um, was somewhat astonished by was um, we drove through Bulgaria and we spent a night in the second city of Bulgaria. Now, who here has been to Plovdiv? <laughs> ah, good. Good, good audience. Always, I know. Well done. Because um, Plovdiv was this, it's the second biggest town in Bulgaria and it is an absolute delight. Mm. It's got um, mosques, it's got orthodox churches, it's got a pedestrianized main street with little street cafes, it's got some very nice boutique hotels. Um, why did I not know about Plovdiv before? Was it in the Lonely Planet Guide? It is in the Lonely okay. Planet Guide. It was even one of the cities of the year in um, Best of Lonely, you know, about a few years ago. But even at the Lonely Planet office, I was in the Lonely Planet London office about um, two months ago, and I, I, I was talking to the staff there, and I said, okay, how many of you have been to Plovdiv? And nobody had. And I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm going to be the number one friend of Plovdiv <laughs> because I think in a few years' time, you know, we all know, we, we know Prague now, we know Budapest, and Krakow in Poland is on the, the list, you know, a delightful place to visit. Well, Plovdiv should be as well. Plovdiv it is. Plovdiv it is, yeah, go there. Ryanair fly there direct from London. So you can fly there for ten dollars. But good luck <laughs> if you <laughs> choose to fly with. <coughs> um, how how has travel changed in your time in the as industry? Well, you know it, it's changed. You know the ways we all know that the the jumbo jets have come in and we can go further and cheaper and so on and moved on to the the Dreamliners and the triple sevens and the Airbus whatevers and so there's that the, the ability to travel further and then the the cheap airlines that here are the Southwest and in, in Europe the Ryanairs and the Easy Jets and in Asia the Jet Stars and the Spice Jets in India and you, you know, do know them all. I, I've been on all of them. <laughs> um, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, <laughs> you know the the, the 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 ability to travel cheaply and then the internet that um, that you know that we we were able to do everything instantly. Particularly that what I particularly liked when you can get visas instantly. Mm -hmm. You know that you, instead of having to get the forms and send the form away. Countries that can do visas in a flash, I love. Um, if they make you have to get a visa, much better if they don't ask you for a visa. Um, so the internet and all that things you can do for it. But you know, the biggest change in my life has been uh, one country opening up, China. Mm. When, I started, when I first started traveling, China was a closed door. The first time I, I went to Hong Kong at a time when you went up to the border of um, Hong Kong and China and you looked across and you could say, oh, look, there's a Chinese peasant working in the rice fields. Well, now you'd have to have 100-kilometer vision yeah. to see, you know, f see a rice field from the border. Yeah. But at that time, that was all you saw of China. And now, of course, it's the, the biggest travel destination inbound and outbound. Right. And I, uh, I, I'd go to China regularly and I particularly, I just get a buzz out of young Chinese mm -hmm. because they're so... Lonely Planet is huge in China. Mm -hmm. They love Lonely the Planet. The books. The books, the yeah. The printed books. They're, the printed books, you know. They and, and what is the number one selling Chinese translation of a Lonely Planet guide? Japan. Mm. It's the place where young... You know, the, the governments may not agree, but Chinese travelers all want to go... To, it's got a lot of cultural similarities... But also everything works, you know. They, they haven't got the pollution problems right. and they can say, they can read anything they like and they can say anything they like. So, you know, they, they find that very interesting. And, and for young Chinese, I was in China once just after a golden week and I was asking a Chinese journalist, I said, well, where, where's everybody going this golden week? Young, you know, the, the young people. And the two destinations, they said, well, they're all going to New Zealand because they want nature and they want to go walking and so on. Mm. So young Chinese were going there. And the other place they're all going to is South Korea. Mm. 
because of K-pop and um, the soap operas. And he said, oh, the young women all want to go there and buy the latest South Korean fashions that they've seen on television, and, um, and the young Chinese in, in particular. So, you know, these things, these cultural things go far beyond the, the politics. And I know on this trip you drove across the country. Yeah, yeah? through China. Where would you say members of this audience should go or should know oh, about well places that they well may Well, you know, not we know all about. you want to go to Shanghai and Beijing, of course, because, you know, that's the, the big cities. And in fact, every city in China is a big city. <laughs> I, I forget how many cities you went to and we'd say, yeah, I've never heard of this city before. What's the population? Oh, it's only 3 million. Or on one occasion, it's only 8 million. <laughs> and I've never heard of it before. But... Um, there, there were a bunch of cities that I found really interesting. And also, one of the things that, that they are trying to do now, they're just trying to preserve smaller places. Mm -hmm. that the, the little village called Hong Kun, mm -hmm. which is a, a walled, um, walled town, very, very pretty and very popular with Chinese tourists, but it was great to stay there. And we stayed in the, parked the cars outside because there were no cars within the wall and um, stayed in a little hotel in the middle and it was great. Yeah. Um, Jingzhen, which is still the ceramic center of, um, been in the ceramic center of China for over a thousand years. And it's still the ceramic center of China and now a lot of international artists are coming and working there. And I know an Australian artist who every year she spends six weeks working in Jingzhen <laughs> and you know, makes pots and things and then puts them through the kiln with all the local Chinese artists. You know, her, her pots join theirs. Yeah. And, and quite a few American and Australian and British artists are working in Jingzhen. So that was really nice to see. And then there was a, a one of Pingyao, which is a, a, again a walled city and um, Global Heritage has worked on that for a number of years. And that's become a very big tourist destination. Mm. A lot of, um, very popular with Chinese. But um, there's, the Global Heritage is also working on um, villages in Guizhou province, which um, the villages are getting depopulated. People are working, get moving into cities to work. And there's some very interesting architecture and culture in these villages. And, and the infrastructure is there. Yeah, yeah. I guess there they needs protection and being right. looked after. But the place I, on this trip I really loved is, uh, is Maijishan, which again, Global Heritage wor is working with it. And it's this big sort of rock face riddled with caves. Mm. Um, and it was a great Buddhist center. And there's amazing Buddha statues on the face of the rock face and images within the caves and paintings and so on. And then these um, sort of walkways and um, bridges and... It's, it's almost like, a, you know, kids would love it yeah. because it's a real sort of adventure travel thing almost, climbing up these sort of steps and ladders and walking the walkways across and ducking into the caves. Yeah. And it just, it looks magical. Wow. Um, I just, I was knocked out by Maji Shan. I, hmm. I thought, well, why didn't I know about it before? And right. But, you know, the, gr the greatest regret of my travel life was that I, I went through Afghanistan in 72 and I, I didn't go up to Bamiyan and I've, I've been back to, Af I was back in Afghanistan in 2006 because there was a little m window of opportunity and a lot of people thought that Afghanistan was going to be opening up to tourism mm -hmm. again. Um, and of course, it unfortunately, it hasn't. It's gone backwards. But um, in 2006, I spent three weeks traveling around Afghanistan and I went back to Bamiyan and of course, the Buddhas aren't there anymore. Mm. The Taliban destroyed them just a few weeks before 9-11. And that's the greatest regret of my travel Having life. Not that I, seen them. I had the opportunity to go there and I didn't take it up. Yeah. But you can go to places in China where they're not as uh, quite as impressive as the the Bamiyan Buddhas, but there are some amazing um, stone cave Buddhas in China, the Yungang Caves near um, fairly near Beijing and other places, you know, with amazing Buddha images. And I know that we were talking a bit about Myanmar. Yeah, and I've been there. You were there fairly recently for yeah. the literary festival. Should people go? A, right very, now? a very good question. And I, I was in Myanmar for the last week, and I've, I've been to Burma as it used to be quite a few times over the years. And it's been, I, I was saying when I was there last week, there were, I had a phase in the 90s, in the early 2000s, when a lot of people were saying to me, Lonely Planet should not be doing a guidebook to Burma, and you should not be going to Burma because by going there, you're not supporting Aung San Suu Kyi. And now that I'm being told I should not be going to Burma, <laughs> because by going there, I'm supporting Aung San Suu Kyi. So it's been a sort of total inversion. And, you know, the Rohingya thing, whether it's ethnic cleansing or genocide, is terrible. Mm -hmm. And 
then going to a literary festival seemed like doing something sort of wishy-washy when there's something terrible happening there. But actually, the discussion about what was happening was a major part of this festival. And we had a number of writers who'd um, been studying Burma for ages. In fact, one of them was uh, Delphine Schrank, who's a, a, an American journalist who was in Burma during the democracy movement for the Washington Post and wrote a book about it. And she was going straight. She didn't, you know, that one of the things, they, they had, they've stopped journalists going in there, but she had was able to pull the strings to get in. So I'm expecting to read some reports from her about what's happening there very soon because this festival just ended on this last on Sunday. I've come straight from there to here. Yeah. And um, a lot of the discussion there was about what was happening and why. And, but unfortunately, it was one of these usual things that you go somewhere and you learn an awful lot and you, you know a lot more about it and you understand less. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of it, if, if someone said, you know, now I said, I know this about it and that about it and something else, but do I understand why it's happening? I do not. Yeah. It's a very, very strange situation. And yeah. I've, I've got a website and I, I put up my, my thoughts about it on my website after I've been there. So I also spent um, a couple of days in the old, there's a new capital, Naipitor, which I went to visit as well. That's a, a strange place. But I also went to Yangon. In Myanmar. In Myanmar. Yeah. They built their own new capital. So Rang what used to be Rangoon and now it's called Yangon is no longer the capital, mm. but, um, but it's still the biggest city. And I went there and Planet Wheeler, our uh, foundation, has a number of projects in Myanmar. So I was able to, medical and health, mm -hmm. that's the two things, education, that we, we work on. And um, I was able to meet with the people who r run those projects when I was there. Medical Action Myanmar is one of them, Action Aid's another one, and talk with them about what they thought about it. In fact, Action Aid um, in Myanmar is run by a, a Bangladeshi Muslim. Mm. He's been living in, um, you know, and has no problem at all being a Muslim in Bangladesh. And yet, this, this problem is going on on the borders of Bangladesh. Yeah. I also met with um, Tont Mindu, who um, is the grandson of um, U Tont, the um, UN Secretary General during the, the 60s. And he, one of the things he's done is he's discovered his grandfather's house had sort of fallen apart and gone back to the jungle. And he's... he's um, restored it and turned it into an international meeting center. It's only been opened in the last year or so. But um, you go around it and it's full of photographs of his grandfather, Utant, um, an amazing period when he was the UN Secretary General because it was the period of the Congo going wrong and the Cuban Missile Crisis. There's, there's pictures of his grandfather with Khrushchev and with Kennedy and with wow. um, Dag Hammarskjöld before he died. And you know, um, um, amazing, you know, time that he was the um, Secretary General. Yeah. I want to get a little philosophical, if you don't mind. Um, do you think that there's a difference between a traveler and a tourist? <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, we're all tourists. Mm -hmm. So, um, we, you know, people who want to be sort of fussy about it like to say, you know, that tourists are just people who get on the cruise ship or whatever and, you know, t and travelers are the people who get there and they don't know where they're going to stay tonight. Right. And I, I sometimes I very, uh, these days I very often do know where I'm going to stay tonight, but uh, I'll tell a little story on that in a second. But, um, we, uh, you know, the, I do generally have, have decisions made, but once upon a time I did a lot of travel where I didn't know where it was going to be. Every night was a surprise where we ended up. Many years ago, when my kids were quite small, we went to Mexico, and I was still at the phase of just doing that, you know, just staying every night. And we had a, we got there just at the wrong time, and everything was booked out. And then we actually, uh, on a couple of occasions, actually booked hotels. And we got there, and they'd lost our booking <laughs> or something, and we were end, ended up walking up and down the street of some small town looking for a place to stay. And for a few years, my kids would always say to me, Dad, have we got a hotel booked here, or is it going to be like Mexico? <laughs> 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 you know, li like Mexico was a symbol for <laughs> Dad hadn't done things properly. <laughs> so now you've learned. I've learned, yeah. Um, who are some of your favorite travel writers? There were travel books. Oh, I, I, I like all of them. Um, and I've I met quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Paul Thoreau, you know, I, I like his famous grumpiness and... Um, <laughs> I've, um, I, I, I had breakfast with Paul Thoreau in London about three or four years ago. And, uh, I, you know, the great railway bazaars is his great idea. And I thought, 
I had this idea of doing a book, and I actually I did write it, and nobody wanted to publish it. Um, <laughs> because I'm not with Lonely Planet anymore, and I can't make them publish things. <laughs> and I thought I'd call it The Great, the great, um, the great Airline Bazaar. And I, what I did was I set out from London, and I flew from London to Australia. It took me a month. Um, you, can fly, you can do it in 24 hours. You just get on one plane, and you get off in Dubai, and you get on another plane, and you're in Australia. But I took a month over it, because I did the whole thing on um, the low-cost carriers. Mm. So I, I have flown on all of them. I've flown on SpiceJet and Pegasus and... Um, Jetstar Asia, and you, you name it, I've been on all of them. Um, and I, I flew it one hour at a time. I flew, I flew, the first one was EasyJet from London to Marseille. The second one was Ryanair from Marseille to Rome. The third one was Pegasus, I think it was, or something from Rome to Athens. And, and would I, you spend a few days? No, I spent a couple yeah. of days in each place. It was fine. Really? Yeah, it all worked out really well. And, wow. Uh, one hour at a time. It didn't cost, it, it, you know, it could have been cheaper just to bought one sure. ticket. But it wasn't, it wasn't enormously expensive. Yeah. And, and, you know, any airline's fine for one hour. Yeah. It doesn't, doesn't matter how cramped you as are. As long one as hour. it takes off. Yeah, as long as it takes off. And they did, definitely did take off. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was a great trip. But um, so Paul Thoreau, you know, has been inspiration over the years. I, I also I became reasonably good friends with Eric Newby, the English author mm -hmm. who wrote um, Short Walk in the Hindu Kush. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful book. That, that book starts with, um, he, it was his, I think it was his first travel book, and um, he's working in London, and he's ju it's just after World War II, and he's, he's bored with his job, and he'd like to do something more interesting. And he says to, his, to a friend, he says, I forget what the friend's name was, we'll call him John, he says, John, I want to do something different. Why don't we just drive to Afghanistan and climb a few previously unclimbed mountains? <laughs> And his friend says, great idea, Eric, except we don't know anything about mountain climbing. <laughs> and Eric says, that's okay, John. We'll go to Wales for the weekend and learn how. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's the start of the book. And get, they go to Wales for the weekend and learn how to climb mountains <laughs> and then set off to Afghanistan and have a short walk in the Hindu Kush. It's a wonderful wow. book, you know, because it's this totally unprepared travel. And, and tell us the name of it again. A Short Walk in yeah. the Hindu Kush. And later on, I, uh, one of my, again, my proud moments at Lonely Planet, and I will tell in a second my proudest moment at Lonely Planet, but one of my proud moments was um, all Eric Newby's books went out of print in, um, and I was at a talk at a Book Passage here in San Francisco, and, uh, and I was asked a similar sort of question. I said, look, Eric Newby, I said, he's my go-to for great travel books, and Short Walk in Hindu Kush is the book. And... Um, they said it's out of print. Mm. And I said, what? I couldn't believe it. And it was out of print. And, I, and as a result, Lonely Planet bought the rights to it. And I became Eric Newby's publisher in the United States. That's nice. And I was so <laughs> proud of that. You know, to be, and as a result, I met Eric and Wanda, his wife. And they, you know, that, both of them are dead now, unfortunately. I saw Wanda just a couple of years ago, just before she died. Um, but they were a wonderful couple. Just uh, the, the story of their romance, which I won't go into, but there's a book about how they met when he was an escaped prisoner of war in Italy during the war mm. and was taken in by his fam her family and um, sheltered, hidden from the Nazis. Um, and eventually he was recaptured. And um, anyway, it's a long story, but you should read about it because yeah. it's a great romance. But the, my, the proudest moment of my Lonely Planet history was... Um, the uh, Ethiopia, which was, you know, run by this dictator, Mengistu, who's now living in Zimbabwe, and looked after by Mugabe. But as um, the, the rebels were, you know, the revolution broke out and um, the things were going wrong for Mengistu and the rebels were, um, were winning, they, the, the Ethiopian army was falling apart and the, the Russia was no longer supporting Mengistu because was going wrong for the Russian, for so the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was about to collapse. And um, the rebels had captured tanks and they were closing in on Addis Ababa, the capital. And there was one British journalist who was with the rebels. He was the only journalist who was actually behind the, the lines with the rebels. And when they were just a couple of days out of Addis Ababa, the, the rebel commander said to him, he said, you know, I haven't been back to Addis Ababa for 20 years now. He said, many of my men have never been to Addis Ababa. And although we've got these captured Russian tanks, we're really afraid that we're going to sort of come into um, Addis Ababa and get lost. We're not going to be able to find our way to the palace in the center of town. 
And the journalist said, the only thing I had was my Lonely Planet Africa guide. Wow. But it had a map of Addis Ababa in it, and I showed it to the rebel commander, and he said, that'll do. And they had, a, as well as captured tanks, they had a captured photocopier, and they took the Lonely Planet guide, and they photocopied the Addis Ababa map and distributed it to all the tank drivers. Wow. So as the tanks rolled into Addis Ababa, they were led there. You know, you go by the cheap hotel, you turn left by the restaurant, and... And I thought that was great, you know, we, we get to recommend restaurants and hotels and occasionally overthrow governments. <laughs> That's a, quite a legacy. <laughs> mm, I was proud of that. <laughs> so we've been collecting some of your questions and uh, I'd like to throw some hard balls your way here. Actually, this is a good one. Um, how did you settle on the name Lonely Planet? That is a good one. And, you know, it's... I, I was saying, we were talking to some students before we, um, we came in here, and I was saying that, you know, it, it is a lonely planet. It's the only planet out there we know that has life on it. It's, it's out there in, the, um, in the, the universe, as far as we know, all by itself, lonely. Uh, but also, in, in recent years, I've seen various sort of scientific stories um, talking about Astronomers discovering a planet going around some remote star, and there'll be a story headlined, um, a, st a new lonely planet discovered. And you know they're, they're sort of riffing off yeah. the name of lonely planet. But that's kind of nice, the way it's become part of the language. But actually, when we did the very first book, we'd finished writing the book, Maureen and I, and we were putting the book together. It was self-published, our first book, and then it became a publishing house that, out of self-publishing. And um, we thought, we've got everything except a name for the business. What are we going to call the business? And we'd just been to see a rock and roll band on the road movie called Mad Dogs and Englishmen. And it's Leon Russell and Joe Cocker um, traveling around the United States. It's a great film, great music in it. And one of the songs is called Space Captain. And Joe Cocker sings the opening line, Once while traveling across the sky, this lonely planet caught my eye. And I thought, that sounds good. And I said to Maureen, that sounds nice. Why don't we just call it Lonely Planet? And Maureen said, well, that's a great idea, except actually he <laughs> sings Lovely Planet. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a mistake, you know. The, it should have been, it's, it's, it's a 45-year mistake. It should have had a different name. In fairness to you, his lyric, I mean, it's a little marble mouth. Yeah, so, yeah. You know. Um, this is a nice one. You're an experienced traveler, and you've bounced back from financial hardship. Do you have any advice for directionless people just out of college? You're not directionless, <laughs> whoever you are. I guarantee you, you will find a direction. And, yeah, and, the, and the direction is to do something you love. You know, if you're, if you're, doing, what, you know, if you're doing something you love, the, um, the fact that it doesn't make any money doesn't really matter. You know, you, you're, you're enjoying what you're doing. And if it does make money, it's a double bonus. You've enjoyed yourself. You know, the worst thing to do is to be in a job that you don't like, mm -hmm. you know, that you're not, you're not getting a kick out of. Because then you're, where's it, where's it taking you? It's not taking you anywhere. And I always think, you know, the people whose businesses are successful, half of the reason they're successful is because they love it. You know, that you can, you, if, if you love something, it's easy to sell because, you know, you'd mm -hmm. buy it yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've, I've never been a salesman, but I've always loved Lonely Planet Guides, and I could sell it because of that. Yeah, the passion. Passion. Yeah. Have a passion for whatever you're doing. If you had to stay in one country for the rest of your life, <laughs> my God, this is like doom to Tony Wheeler, yeah. where would it be? I, I really don't know, but um, there's lots of countries I've been back to, and one of the countries I've been back to a lot of times, and I've, and I've always enjoyed it there, is, um, is Nepal. And the reason you go to Nepal, you know, you go there for the temples and Kathmandu is a wonderful city and Global Heritage is restoring an earthquake-damaged temple in um, the mm. Kathmandu Valley at the moment. But um, the, the, the reason people go to Nepal, a lot of them, is for walking. You know, you, it's got the best walking in the world. I'm, I'm, you know, it's great walking in the States. It's the Appalachian Trail and I've walked around Yosemite and things. But um, Nepal, you know, you're in the Himalayas. You're the world's tallest mountains and you... You walk up to the Everest Base Camp or you walk around the Annapurna Circuit. You know, it's just wonderful walking. Um, and the, the people at the end, you know, the, you, you say to them, okay, what's, um, what's, what was really good about that? And, you know, and, and they've gone there. It's going to be the mountains. I'm going to be blown away by the mountains. And you are. But what they're really blown away is by the people. Yeah. You know, I've had all these great, great contacts with people. I think one of the other things about walking, one of the treks we did there once 
We, we did a children's walk. We took um, my kids were at that point 10 and 8, and we had, um, we had a couple of six-year-olds and some friends as well. Two six-year-olds we had. So they were from six to, I think the oldest child was 11. And the um, person who organized this trek, was one of the trek, you know, with tents and a Sherpa cook and everything. But the, um, the people who organized it for us in Nepal sent along some Nepalese kids. Mm. So the, the cook brought along his two sons and the Sherpa leader brought along his daughter. So we had all these Nepalese kids as well. And all the kids got on the gas on fire. Yeah. You know, we get to the end of the day and the adults are just sort of <laughs> dying <laughs> and the kids are off playing hide and seek and, you know, <laughs> counting up to 50 in Nepalese. Cool. It was great. It was fantastic. <laughs> Um, there's a question in here that ties to that. How do you get around a country when you don't speak the local language? Um, you know, I was talking about this with the students again earlier on this evening as well. Y you know, it's, it's always worth having a few words. Yeah. Going, you know, going to, going in and being able to say hello, goodbye, yes, no, please, thank you. You know, d even those few words open doors to you to some extent. A lot of countries, it's easy to pick up the. I always say Indonesian is my, my best language because although I've never studied it, it's a very easy language to pick up. Mm. And the Indonesians are so welcoming mm -hmm. when you do use their language that it really does, does open doors for you. But the other thing is the reason you're, you're, you are somewhere is because you want to do s – you're, you're in a bus station because you want to buy a bus, a bus ticket. And I, I really find this in, ch in China now. Travel is so easy. Because so many things are, you go into a bus station, you walk up to the counter, you've got written down, you know, you, you're going to recognize the characters of the town you mm -hmm. want to go to. The, the person behind the counter turns her computer screen around for it so you can see. You've shown her the name of the town. She points at the name of the town. She points at the hour as the bus goes. You say, I want that time. And, you know, you haven't had to use language it at works. all. It works. Yeah. You know, the reason you're at the front desk of the hotel is you want to sleep there tonight. Right. And, you know, they find you a bed. The reason you're in a restaurant is you want food in front of you. And yeah. even if you can't say a word, you can point at what somebody else is eating yeah. and say, I'll have that, but make sure it's been dead first. Uh, <laughs> I often think in Japan, you know, you're the most important <laughs> phrase in the Japanese phrase book is, please bring me something that's already <laughs> dead. <laughs> I don't want it climbing off my plate. <laughs> well, it's, I, I, I often think that travel is an antidote to fear and you know, when you are apprehensive about going to a new place or trying to tell your taxi driver or the bus driver that you, you need to get off here, and then you just do it yeah. once, twice, three times, suddenly that level of anxiety dissipates. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I was on KQED this morning, and a couple of people called in who, you know, nice people saying them saying nice things to me and saying how they'd gone off on some trip with a lonely planet guide and i think it was a uh, it might have been someone who i talked to afterwards who said they did their f their first big trip was spending a long time in india mm. with our india guide and i love our india guide of all the lonely planet books that i've worked on so i helped write that one you know the india guide's the one i'm most proud of because it was a big dif di big difficult country mm -hmm. to sort of put together in a book and people who spend a lot of time traveling around India, really develop an affinity with the place and, you know, and learn to love it. Yeah. Um, and I, I love that when people do have that relationship with a, a place. And very often big trips do give that to you. Yeah. But the other, one of the other things I love, and again, I was talking to the students tonight, you know, the, the European thing of a gap year between, um, between school and university. You, know, you go off away and go somewhere or work in that country for a while or travel in that country. I, I've, I've often said that you know they'll learn more in that gap year yeah. than they will in the last five years of school or the next three years of university. Yep. They'll come back, you know, having done things for themselves. You know, we you never really travel until you travel by. You know, when you're traveling with your parents, you may go to all these places, and then suddenly you're by yourself and you think, how do you book a hotel? <laughs> How, wh how much do you tip in restaurants? Yeah. How, do, uh, how do you get a visa? Yeah. You know, because your parents did it for you. Yeah. And when suddenly you're doing it for yourself, it's sort of opening the world up to you. It's um, yeah. great, great experience. I think, you know, often we say at Afar with our foundation that travel is the best form of education. It's and great. It, yeah. And you learn about the world. You learn, you know, it, it, it's how we introduce ourselves to each other. Mm -hmm. People in the country, I mean, now everybody travels everywhere, and I've 
met, you know, people from the weirdest countries and the weirdest places. But, you know, there are still countries where people don't get out of their own country very much. Yeah. So if they're going to meet foreigners, it's because of the foreigners coming there. We work in a school in Oakland with high school students who haven't seen the ocean before we took them to Point Reyes. So yeah. to get to go to Costa Rica or China or Peru, I wow. mean, it, yeah. it opens yeah. the world quite yeah. literally to, to these students. Do it, yes. Um, what do you think the future is for guidebooks? Well, you know, it's all, it's all changing. And uh, the Lonely Pad actually was very early on into um, uh, that the... the um, First occasion I can really remember this, getting onto internet stuff and so on, was in 94. 94 is early days in, on the internet, 23 years ago. Yeah. And um, O'Reilly Bay Area publishers, who were pioneers on yeah. web publishing, Tim O'Reilly. I mean, he, Tim O'Reilly is the guy who invented the thing, you know, Web 2.0. Yeah. I, I know Tim. And um, they d he was setting up a, a one of the pioneering um, websites. It was called... Um, um, uh, Global Network Navigator, GNN. And um, he, d uh, Maureen and I were doing a trip across America. We did a trip in a 59 Cadillac. We bought this Cadillac in San Francisco. And we drove across with our kids to Boston and left it in the driveway of one of our <laughs> boss author's houses. And then we came back next school vacation in Australia and we drove it back. So we did, we did 24 states, um, south in the one way and north the other way. And we sent back every day uh, a blog. Mm -hmm. The word blog was, hadn't been invented, but mm -hmm. we re I realized now what we were doing was sending back a blog. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of early um, to Tim O'Reilly. Um, that was early sort of getting into the, the internet. And Lonely Planet's not always, we did a guidebooks on Palm Pilots. Remember Palm Pilots? Um, a sort of a early old. Did you do the Newton? Remember the Newton? Yeah, we didn't do the Newton, mm. no, but <laughs> Palm Pilots we did. Yeah. So we did a lot of that stuff, and now Lonely Planet's doing lots of digital stuff and apps and things. But uh, And I still use Lonely Planet guides a lot, but I, I must admit I rarely use them on paper these days. I, most of the time I, um, I, I have them on, my t on a tablet. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I do sometimes. If I'm going somewhere, I know I'll, the book's going to be sitting regularly in the hotel room or it could be sitting on the front seat of the car or something or on a boat then I'll take a, a paper guidebook. But most of the time, I'm doing digital. And, of course, there's so many other ways these days, from TripAdvisor to yeah. God knows how many app sites and so on. There's so many other ways. But they, they're all ways of getting information. But the guidebook still works. It never, the batteries never go flat. You drop it in the river, and it's still pull it out and dry it off, and it'll still yeah. work. Yeah. Good things, books. I like books still. In any of the countries you've been to... Have you ever been scared for your life? M most of the occasions I've been scared for my life have been in the back seat of taxis. Mm. And I think I or wish when I your daughter was driving. Or when my daughter was driving, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the only t occasion I've had when um, I've really been frightened, um, re really frightened, was with my daughter. And it was in Guatemala when she, um, sh she got food poisoning. Mm. And... Um, we didn't sort of realize how serious it was, and it, it, it sort of came on late at night, and um, we were in a small town, and um, I w both of us were getting really frightened. We'd sort of said, you know, early in the day, we think, well, we'd, if she doesn't improve later on, we'll, we'd gone to the pharmacy and got this and that, and, but she, she was just throwing up and um, had terrible diet. It was awful. And uh, late at night, I finally thought, I've got to do something, and um, I went down to the front in my terrible Spanish, asked, you know, if I, where I'd find a doctor or something in the um, front desk of the hotel. And the, um, the, the guy at the front desk, late at night, said, there's a doctor lives next door. Mm. And I went and hammered on his door at sort of midnight. And um, I don't know if he saved my daughter's life, but he came round and, you know, before we know it, he'd driven off to his hospital and come back and put her on a drip. Wow. Um, and I was, you know, I, that was the most terrified I've ever been. And it wasn't for me, it was for my daughter. Sure. And, you know, I, I did a talk about that for Moth, the um, New York-based... Mm -hmm. um, storytelling. Storytelling yeah. thing. And they've just done a book on Moth stories and that story about my daughter being ill and how she now runs our foundation and yeah. travels a lot popped up in that. But mm. again, it's an example of sort of the kindness of strangers. It is. You're knocking on this Absolutely, stranger's you know, door in the middle of the yeah, night. Yeah, the kindness of strangers is definitely one of the things you'll find from travel. Yeah. The funniest um, 
um, night almost of my, of my travel life is when Maureen and I arrived in Australia, we got off this yacht and um, we, we, we knew we were going to, we still had more than 27 cents at this point, but <laughs> we're, still, we're still two weeks away from arriving in Sydney. And we, we wanted to get going immediately. So as soon as we got ourselves stamped into the country, we set off. And we said to the um, little town where we'd arrived, um, you know, where's the nearest big town? And they said, well, it's, it's 100 miles down this dirt road till you get to a, a real road. They said, and then it's another 200 miles till you get to the <laughs> first town. So we went out and started hitchhiking <laughs> and sure enough got picked up. And we got we immediately got picked up by these amazing rides and got handed on from one person to another. And we eventually got handed on to a, a guy who was a, a tire distributor and he said, I was going to stop by the road and sleep in my car tonight, but if you guys can keep me awake, you know, keep talking to me, I'll <laughs> drive through the night until I get home. So I really, I've got a young kid who I want to, you know, a young baby, and I want, I'd like to get home tonight. So we did keep talking, and we got there to his place, and he said, um, I've got a station wagon in the garage, and there's a, you can put a mattress in the back of my station wagon, and you can sleep there tonight. Wow. So our first night in Australia... We were sleeping in the back of somebody's station wagon in their garage. <laughs> and he said, he said, also, he said, um, I, I had an accident with a kangaroo about a, a couple of weeks ago. And I rescued the baby kangaroo out of its pouch. And the baby kangaroo is in that bag hanging <laughs> on the wall of the garage. No. We, ha we have to get up early in the morning to feed the baby kangaroo. Yeah, so if you see any no hear any noises in the night, it's this baby kangaroo <laughs> doing <laughs> somersaults in the... I thought... What a way to arrive in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first night in Australia. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. How have your travels influenced your view on world politics? And I oh. think that'll be our last question for yeah. our radio listeners. So. Do, you, do, you, do you know, there, there was a, the, the Economist today has um, a cover story about, about a certain um, international important president and um, the damage he may be causing. And um, one of the things was, was saying, this article was saying, you know, threatening war on other countries and doing this wrong and that wrong is not good, but also subverting soft power. Because mm. soft power is just as important as tough power, you know. Waving your fist at people and um, threatening to launch missiles may be one thing, but soft power is just as important. And, uh, you know, I, I drove up the Karakoram Highway in Pakistan a couple of years ago into China. And, um, th you know, it's an amazing road and it, it's subject to landslides all the time and you're very often delayed. And it's the, inter it's the route in and the Chinese are putting a huge amount of money into it. And I was thinking as I went up that road, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing Chinese constantly working on this road. There's an awful lot of Chinese equipment comes down and improves this road. And it's, you know, why are the Chinese doing it? Because of trade and they want to, they're going to be sending their stuff down that road and, you know, the One Belt, One Road program they've got going on at the moment. This is all part of it. I said, and just a little bit over to the, to the um, west from where I am now, there are drones flying over and um, sending missiles down and sometimes hitting the right people and sometimes hitting the wrong school. Okay, which one is working better, the, the road building or the drones? Yeah. And I'm sorry, the road building works better. Yeah. And that's soft power. It does, indeed. There you go. I'd like to say good night to our radio listeners and thank Tony Wheeler for this excellent discussion. Thank, thank you, you very you. much. <laughs>